Hey, g'day, it's Prasad. Thanks for stopping by. Now, a little while ago, I showed this set of castings for a Stuart Turner 10H, that's H for horizontal, steam engine. And I uh, showed the kit on camera, was given to me, and I said I was going to go ahead and build the engine, but I wouldn't bother doing a YouTube series on it. Now, my reasoning was that uh, it seems like everybody has done a steam engine build on YouTube, including me. And uh, I was wrong. A lot of people got in touch and they said, no, no, go ahead and do it as a you know, series. We'd love to see it. Now, there were a few people who said, no, don't bother because we've, you know, we're sick of it. And it's the old story. I mean, you can please some of the people all of the time and all of the people some of the time, but you can't, well, you know the rest. So I've decided to go ahead and do this series, but it's going to concentrate mostly on the machining. Now, if there is a process or a setup that's a bit unusual, I'll do that in more detail, but essentially it's just going to be a sort of a director's cut. So uh, that's what's going to happen and I hope you enjoy it, but let's have a look at the castings and talk about the drawings. When I looked through these drawings I realised that Stuart made a common set of castings which are the ones that you can see here, and they could be used to make four different styles of engines. So there was a twin cylinder vertical engine, a twin cylinder horizontal, which I think was called a score. And then there was a single cylinder vertical and a single horizontal, which is the one that I'm making. Now the drawings show parts, uh, or at least show detailed drawings for all of the parts for all of the engines. So you just have to be a bit careful and pick out the detailed drawing for the part that you need to work on. And the first part that needs to be made, or the first part I'm going to start on, is this base casting here.
Now it turns out this casting has a chilled surface on it so it's super hard. Uh, I think it's just taken the edge right off my high speed steel end mill. I'll try and do that with carbide. Well, carb I did it, uh, didn't like it, <laughs> but it's got it done. My right, casting's all done now. I didn't bother to drill through the positions for the mounting holes here. I'll machine this part up first. This is the actual main frame of the engine, and it also has lug positions for the holding down bolts. So I'll drill these out using the positions that are cast into the, the frame, and I'll transfer those onto this base later. If I drill these separately, there's no way in the world they're going to line up. With the bottom of that casting cleaned up now, I need to find the center horizontally through that circular boss there. And we also need to get a vertical height from the bottom of the casting to what will be the center of the crankshaft. Now the center line of the crankshaft also lines up with the center of the circular boss here. Now the only problem is to mark that out, we've got a great big hole there. So I'm gonna fill that up with an aluminum plug. That's just temporary, that will be machined out later on, but now we have a face that we can use to mark our center line on. Uh, paint's a bit rubbish, but uh, white paint on cast iron is a really good sort of marking out fluid. When you scribe a line through that, it'll show up really clearly. So the dimension up from the base of the casting to the center line of the cylinder is 15 sixteenths or 23.81 millimeters. So the upper line there is actually the top of the machining allowance and then the center line of the crankshaft is below that one eighth of an inch or 3.18 millimeters. Okay, well that's the center line there and I need to center punch that very, very accurately. So I'm not gonna do it on camera. <laughs> And that's the center of this flange where the cylinder will connect to. Also the bore where the connecting rod and the crosshead will slide. Ha, huh, nailed it. Now I told you I'd tell you if I had any unusual setups and this one really takes the biscuit. <laughs> I know this looks really dodgy, uh, but there's a reason why I set it up this way. 
So this is the casting that accepts the cylinder on this end. So it's basically the frame of the engine. And as you can see, I've got the center, the tail sock center set up in that aluminum plug there. I've got a dial indicator on the center here. And I've got it to within about a thou, um, what's that, about five hundredths of a millimeter. And that's taken me about three hours. <laughs> uh, you wouldn't believe how difficult it is to find the correct size angle plate with the correct pattern of slots that matches up with the slots in a face plate and then you got to get all the mounting hardware that fits all the slots so uh, it wasn't easy and uh, although you're saying well 500 sort of millimeters a bit a bit wide uh, it's okay uh, I can make it work and this is counterweight uh, I can run this up to about 315 rpm without it vibrating or shaking and all we have to do here is face off the end of this casting here, turn this uh, boss to the correct diameter and then bore out uh, what will be the bore for the crosshead. And it has to be 5 eighths of an inch. Now the casting that fits in that is here and this is oversized. So I can machine this down to fit that bore. So if I don't hit 5 eighths I'm not too bothered about it. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and do this now. Um, I've checked it and double checked it and everything's secure so let's hope for the best. Well, that takes care of the face of the flange, the outer diameter and the bore. Now the bore is like about two hundredths of a millimeter undersize and the only 5.8 reamer I have is this parallel flute uh, machine reamer and they don't like working with an interrupted cut so I'm just going to leave it undersized and I'll machine the crosshead to suit and the last thing I'll do here now is just put a chamfer on the back edge of that flange.
Next step is to machine off these mounting faces for the bearing brasses and then also machine the pocket for the bearing. And I'll just put this on a pallet and I've swept an indicator over this face that we just machined. Uh, we've got that within uh, like 100, maybe less. Just about to machine off the top of this casting here where the bearing brass will fit. I've got a scribe line on there, but that's not really how I'm going to set the height. I've touched off the cutter against the pallet here by putting a 12mm dowel pin between the pallet and the underside of the cutter. And you just do that thing where you roll the dowel pin backwards and forwards till it just passes underneath, and then you offset from there. So I'll clean that off, and then I'm going to do the half round pocket here for the bearings with the ball nose end mill. Right, that's my zero position there in Y, so I'm going to offset now to the centre of the crankshaft. Okay, that's centred over the axis of the crankshaft, uh, that's three and one eighths of an inch. So I've just offset to the centre of this section of the casting here, where one of the studs will be in Y, and now we're going to set the Z height. So I can roll this dowel pin underneath the end of the cutter, until it just passes underneath. So just slowly lowering the knee. All right, just touching it now. And now it's clear. So I'm going to set Z there. Then we're going to offset 12 plus whatever the distance is to the center of the crankshaft axis. Okay, that's a finished depth. I'll just do that in a couple of passes though. Alright, that's a bit tight. Uh, this is just a brass extrusion or pressing, I'm not sure. Uh, it's not exactly the size, but I can dress that with a file. That looks like that's going to be okay. Okay, that puts me over the center of the crankshaft axis and also on the center of the bore for the crosshead. So I'm going to go ahead and drill the four holes now for the studs.
these threads for the studs are 7BA that's British Association pretty common thread type for model engines I've mapped all of these hole positions in touch DRO so I can just go backwards and forwards from one hole position to another While I've got this set up, I'm going to drill through these cast bosses here. These have to be drilled out a clearance size of 7BA. And I've just gone around and mapped all four positions and they're in no way symmetrical. <laughs> and the best I can do here is put a 6mm dowel pin in the chuck and try and align it over that cast boss there. And uh, I'll drill the hole and then I'll just spot face that. Uh, still not sure about this one here. We won't really know until we go to drill the hole but I've got all four positions saved in touch DRO so I can go backwards and forwards and uh, yeah I mean it's just cosmetic really trying to get them in the center of those little cast bosses I went around each of those hole positions and just visually checked it with the drill uh, when I put a spot in the center there and I adjusted them slightly. So I deleted the old position in touch DRO, set a new one and now I'll go back and drill the clearance hole for the 7BA but I'll do that off camera. One of the features I really like about touch DRO is being able to map hole positions as you do a hole pattern. So when I drilled this um, engine base here I marked out the position of all four holes and I logged those positions in touch DRO. So I've got a point list down the right hand side of the screen here and you can see visually on the screen where the four hole positions are including the origin which is the very center of the crankshaft. So what I can do now is I can swap over to the other part of the base and drill exactly the same hole pattern just by moving from point to point and it just means that you can translate those hole positions from one part to another and know that they're going to fit. So this is the, the first casting that I actually machined and I remember saying at the time that I wasn't going to drill these hole patterns because they wouldn't match up with these ones here. So what I've done is I positioned the drill bit in touch DRO for this hole here and then I just moved the casting around on the pallet until it lined up with that little dimple there got clamped down, I checked this edge to make sure it was sort of more or less square to the front edge of the pallet. So as you drive around from point to point and drill the hole pattern, it should match up. Uh, there's only one way to find out though. <laughs> Alright, well I had to stop that process, so you saw me trying to spot all four drilled hole positions in this casting here using the points that I'd saved in touch DRO. Now when I got to this last position and checked the distance between the edge of the base casting and that drilled hole, it was different on both sides and fairly significantly different. Now even though I'd set this casting up so it was square to the front edge of the pallet, just wasn't right. Now this is fairly typical of small castings, uh, they often have discrepancies in, especially in marked out hole positions and bosses and so on. So what I've done is I've put the engine frame back on top of that base casting and I've set the distance between the edges and the edge of the engine frame using a, a gauge here. And I've checked that in three places and I've got that visually correct. Now it means that this base casting is not necessarily square to the pallet but it looks right. So then I put the drill bit back in this drill hole on the other side here and I've used touch DRO to check all four positions so that everything lines up. So I'm going to take this part off now, the, the actual engine frame, and then we'll spot drill the base in its new position and hopefully it's right. And you'll see the discrepancy when I start the drill. 
So this is actually the second to last hole that I was doing and you see the offset there. Uh, it's quite different to what I had set out before and these were actually very close to the marked dimples in this base casting but they just weren't right. So I'll go ahead and do this and then we'll open up a tapping size for 7B8. Uh, so you can see the error there, and uh, I can fill that. Uh, when it's powder coated, you won't even know that was there. But I'll tap this now off camera, and then we'll assemble this base casting and the engine frame. I put some 7BA studs in that base casting now, and the engine frame just drops over those. And as you can see, this gap around this edge here is visually correct. Now, whether everything is parallel or not, I don't know. But at the end of the day, you want it to look right, and uh, the accuracy has to be in this part of the engine, not this part here. Now, these bearing brass pieces here have to be cut in half to make two bearings, one on either side. And as you can see, they fit in there really nicely. And I'm going to do that next section in the next video. And I'm just going to sort of rush through it. Uh, if you want to see in more detail how to do this, check out Joe Pizinski's channel. Now, he made the twin cylinder version of this same engine. I think it's called the Stuart 10. Uh, B, yeah, Stuart Turner 10B, and uh, it has three bearings, uh, two outer bearings and an inner bearing, but you'll see how he did it, uh, and it goes into a lot more detail than I'm going to. So that's all going to be in the next video. I'm going to call it quits at this point here, and uh, ask you to come back and have a look at the next stage of machining. We'll probably get uh, the bearings done and maybe the crankshaft. Now I'm going to leave you with some footage of some animals. Now. As you may know, uh, I support a charity called Wilvos. They're a wildlife volunteer organization. And uh, the lady named Donna that I visited uh, some time ago now when I introduced this idea of donating to Wilvos got in touch today and she sent me some links to some videos of some uh, animals that she's caring for and also some other animals that Wilvos have cared for and put on their Facebook page. So we'll have a look at those clips and uh, I'll do a little bit of commentary and uh, yeah, come back next time and we'll keep going on this little engine here. Okay, Rizzo, see you next time. Cheers. This is a very young top knot pigeon. Now they get their name from having a very distinctive crest on the top of their head when they're adults. And here it is uh, enjoying its first meal of solid food. And this is probably due to be released soon. Now this is a short-eared brush tail possum. Now when they're this age, they're extremely cute, but if you get one living in the roof of your house or in the ceiling of your house, they stomp around all night, keep you awake, and uh, they do uh, get on very well in urban areas. Now these are two very, very young feather gliders. These being fed with a special formula, and these are a true glider. Uh, they're a mammal that can tr uh, fly from tree to tree. Uh, they've got skin stretched between their legs and they can sort of spread their legs out and fly quite well, but only over short distances. And this is one of the same gliders now. This one's uh, almost fully grown and probably due to be released. <laughs>